Hello. So for this video, we're going to talk about Menander. Uh, so I, I've done videos on a number of Menander's plays. Uh, those that, that survive almost entirely intact, which is pretty much just Discolos, um, but also those that we have 40% or more of surviving. Um, I've done videos on those. That means that the majority of Menander's plays that we have bits and pieces of, I haven't done videos on um, because we've got um, we get 13 and then sets of fragments from either unknown plays or uh, unidentified sources. So there's 13 plays that the Oxford World Classics editors have included that have just very, very small amounts of them, less than about 40%. So that's one of the big challenges of working with Menander or, or reading Menander is that so little of his work survives. And even what we've got, even if we had complete plays of all of the things we've got fragments of, that would still be a very small portion of his work because he uh, he wrote probably about 108 plays, um, which is prodigious, certainly by modern standards, but we also, people like um, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes also wrote much larger numbers of plays than contemporary playwrights tend to do. So Menander is certainly a, a, a prodigious writer, and we've got just a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of what he produced, unfortunately. That being said, Menander is an incredibly important figure because he's the only representative we have of what's called new comedy. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, but I want to situate Menander a little bit um, historically. Um, so as the, the Oxford editors say, Menander lived and worked in Athens at the end of the 4th and beginning of the 3rd century BC. Almost certainly he was born in 342 or 341 and died at the age of 52 in 291 or 290. His first play was produced in 321 and in the next 30 years he wrote perhaps 108 plays, um, an astonishing rate of productivity but not unparalleled for a Greek comic poet. So. What is, why is this significant? Well, so one thing that we want to note here is that Menander is writing almost a century after um, many, uh, after the big four. So Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes are all writing in the 5th century BCE. So they're all writing in the 400s. Menander is writing in the 300s into the 200s. So this is a very different Athens that Menander is in than these previous four playwrights that we're familiar with. One of the things is that by the time Menander comes along, Athens has lost the Peloponnesian War with Sparta, which means that Athens is no longer the superpower of Greece, or one of the superpowers of Greece. Um, after the end of the Peloponnesian War, Athens's power declines dramatically. Uh, the Delian League is, is sort of taken apart. Uh, Greek Athenian democracy is uh, replaced, and then there's turmoil for the better part of a century, uh, and then at some point the uh, the Macedonians under Philip II come along and conquer uh, Athens, and so and and then Alexander the Great uh, rules as well. So we've got this Macedonian dynasty, and then I'm I'm more familiar with the timeline of, of fifth century uh, Athens, but at some point, I forget when exactly, um, 
Athens becomes embroiled in these these wars uh, over Alexander's successors. So um, that's part of the the context for Menander as well. Now, and and and, and that's significant. His political context is significant because because. Um, under Athenian democracy, things like freedom of speech, equality, uh, equality before the law, equality of citizens, things like this, were core values. By the time you get to uh, the, turn, the turn of the third century, I guess you'd say turn of the third century, around the year 300, um, so around the time that Menander is, is working, that's not necessarily the case as much. There's still a value to things like freedom of speech and, and equality before the law, but they're not as central and they're not as they're not as ideologically encoded as they were during the age of Athenian democracy. So that shapes new comedy. Um, so new comedy is the third of three broad categories of comedy that classicists uh, attribute to ancient Greeks. Uh, the first being old comedy. Almost all of Aristophanes' work is old comedy. Then you've got, and I'll, so I'll, I've talked in my, my video on Aristophanes about some of the things that, that characterize old comedy. But then you've got middle comedy. Um, Aristophanes' play Plutus is kind of regarded as an example of new com or of, of middle comedy. Um, so it steers away from the political. Uh, it becomes more interested in myth and things like this, uh, rather than sort of the immediate political situation. And then you get to new comedy, Menander's work. Menander being the, the sort of key example of this. Oh, uh, the other thing that's worth mentioning uh, about Menander and, and about his work and the, the set, sorry state we have of it is that um, almost nothing of Menander's was available from antiquity up through the 1950s when a bunch of Menander's stuff, including Discolos, which is the only play we have that's almost entirely intact, uh, all that stuff was rediscovered in a cave or something in Egypt. Um, so, so scholarly work on Menander is very, very recent as well. So uh, to understand new comedy, the Oxford World Classics editors give us a, a, a list of six things um, that characterize new comedy or that distinguish it from old comedy. So the first is that new comedy is not political. Whereas Aristophanes, under old, under old comedy, would very often engage directly with contemporary political situations. He would mock particular people. Creon was a big target for Aristophanes. You don't get that in Menander. He is not engaging in political commentary. Um, the second thing that they list the role of music is substantially diminished. Now, we obviously don't get music in the texts of the plays, but the thing, one of the things that points us in this direction is that the chorus has almost no role in the plot of Menander's plays. So, for the big four, the chorus is a key, key, key figure. I mean, in some plays, like, um, um, Aeschylus is the suppliant women, for instance, the chorus is the protagonist, really. In Menander's plays, all that we get is choral interludes, where the chorus comes on and dances. They aren't commenting on the action, they aren't, um, they aren't asserting that one character is right and another character is wrong, they aren't trying to make peace between feuding characters, whatever it is that they do in uh, tragedy and in old comedy. In new comedy, they are just there to dance and they're usually drunk. Uh, so that's the second thing. Uh, the third thing, we have a five-act structure that develops 
in Menander. And this is a, a revolution in, in playwriting that continues into the present, really. I mean, um, so plays, like I, I talked a lot about this in uh, my video on Epitropontes. Um, the five act structure, that's a play that really shows Menander's five act structure. This is a, a strategy that people didn't use prior to this. Like the big four didn't use five act structure. They didn't have these, these sort of clear delineations that helped organize the arc of the plot. Menander does. And then we see that in uh, Shakespeare and the English Renaissance. We see that in French classical drama. We see that, I think, in Spanish Golden Age drama. Uh, we see that in uh, 19th century melodrama. And even into the 20th century, some playwrights continue to use a five-act structure, although its, its popularity has dropped off. But that five-act structure, which gives you a, a distinct sense of rising action and then resolution at the end, that's something that Menander possibly creates for all we know. Um, so that's a crucial thing. Um, the fourth thing, love is central. Heterosexual love, um, not always uh, within marriage, but often within marriage. Um, these are these are rom-coms in a way. Um, they are the, the predecessors of romantic comedies um, in the sense that the plots are almost always about either a young couple who want to be together and can't for one reason or another, or about a couple who is together and then something happens to drive them apart and then they get brought back together at the end. So almost all of the plays run on this structure. So these are these are love-centered plays uh, in a way that we don't get with Aristophanes. Fifth, fifth thing. Um, irony is, is, is the central tool maybe in Aristophanes' toolbox. Um, comic irony, so in terms on the level of individual jokes, individual language, things like this, comic irony, uh, reversal of expectations, things like this is very, very central. But then the other big one is dramatic irony, which, um, as I talked about in my videos on Aspis and uh, Paracanamene, is when characters make decisions thinking that they have all of the relevant information, but we, the audience slash reader, know crucial pieces of information that they do not. So dramatic irony is really central. Like for me, that's the driving force of a play like Aspis. Uh, and then the sixth, sixth characteristic of new comedy as Menander practiced it is the use of stock characters. So this is really significant, uh, carrying through to Roman comedy and then into things like Commedia dell'arte, which depends almost entirely on stock characters. So you tend to have the same kinds of figures in the same kinds of situations, play after play after play. Um, and there, what you work with largely is variations on a theme. And what's really interesting to me about Menander and the way he uses stock characters is that they're stock characters who often have the same names. So um, Hebreton, the flute girl slash prostitute, um, Smicernes, the aging miserly uncle or father, um, Douse, the clever slave clever, cowardly uh, slave. And Das is actually a really interesting figure because uh, especially in the comedy of Plutus, the, Rome, the Roman comic playwright, um, the clever slave is a really central figure. And then we kind of get this clever slave slash servant carried through 
um, into the Renaissance and then even into uh, characters like uh, Jeeves in the Jeeves and Worcester series from P.G. Wodehouse or Beach in uh, in the um, in the Blanding series by P.G. Wodehouse. And then we can even think of this in, ter in terms of Baldrick in the, fir the first season of Blackadder. Um, in the second through the fourth season, uh, Baldrick kind of becomes progressively stupider. But in the first season, he's, he's quite a clever servant uh, to Lord Blackadder. Uh, Baldrick, played by the incomparable Tony Robinson, for those of you who are fans. Uh, and so that's a figure that we, as far as we can tell, we start to get with Menander. So these are some of the things that characterize Menander and that characterize new comedy. Um, it's very much more familiar to what we, what we think of today with comedy than uh, something like Aristophanes is.